Welcome to our discussion with um, our alumni colleagues here this evening. And really, this is a chance for you to hear from them and about their experiences of study here, and hopefully to have time for you to pose some questions to them, if you like, as well. Um, so I'll introduce them without further ado. Uh, first of all, Janice Alozi, correct? Yes, um, Director of Effectiveness and Performance at STEP Academy Trust. Janice is the Director of Effectiveness and Performance across STEP Academy Trust, and her role means that she's focused on the quality and standards of education across all the STEP Academies. Janice is also a Lead Ofsted Inspector of Primary and Secondary Schools. Prior to joining STEP, Janice was employed as a Deputy Head Teacher, and she was also a Standards and Excellence Commissioner for a local authority, working with secondary and primary school clusters. Welcome, Janice. Thank you. And David Malcolm, Policy and Campaigns at the National Uni Union of Students, the NUS to you and me. David's responsible for the NUS's work across education and social policy, as well as public affairs and campaigns, with a personal focus on student finance and widening participation, including lead authorship of NUS's recent Poverty Commission report. He's also worked on secondment for the Equality Challenge Unit as their Deputy Chief Executive and Head of Policy. He studied for his MA in Higher and Professional Education at the UCL Institute of Education, using his dissertation to look at the experience of students living in the parental home. Then on my left, I have Priya Patel, Project Manager at Pearson Education. Following her graduation from University of Southampton, Priya received a place on the Teach First Development Programme as a secondary maths teacher, where she started her PGCE at the UCL Institute of Education. And within a year, she moved into teacher training and used this knowledge to volunteer for the Guangdong Province Education Department in China and an NGO in Uganda too. Priya moved out of teaching in 2017 into her current role within pedagogy and school improvement at Pearson Education. She's also a school governor chairing teaching, learning and standards subcommittee. And finally, Valerie Sampson, who's former assistant head teacher at St Andrew the Apostles School. Valerie's been teaching for over 15 years and has held a number of senior positions in a variety of secondary schools in London. She trained at the UCL Institute of Education and completed a PGCE in secondary maths in 2003, followed by a master's in mathematics education in 2008. After completing her master's, Valerie wrote articles for the Mathematics Teaching Journal. She's an experienced senior, senior leader and was the professional coordinating mentor for her school. And she's currently studying for the MPQCSL qualification here at the IOE. So real welcome to all panelists. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. That's a real uh, rich range of experiences and expertise. Um, and I'd really like to start with asking each of you to say something about why you chose to take your course. What was the motivation for you in the course that you've studied here? Perhaps we can start with you, Valerie. Um, okay, I, I studied, thank you. I studied for a PGC in secondary mathematics and masters in maths education because of my interest and passion um, for teaching. I had an extremely positive experience um, of studying to become a maths teacher at the institute. And when I'd been teaching for five years, I felt the time was right to deepen my, my knowledge and to think about undertaking a masters where I'd be able to think about the issues that students learning mathematics today faced. Um, I knew that having a master's would help me to contribute to my professional goals that I set for myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Priya. So I was in a slightly unique position in that I didn't choose to study at the IOE, although I would have done anyway. Um, <laughs> I actually attained a place for my PhD here through Teach First, um, so it's slightly different. was working on a 70% timetable teaching in an unqualified year whilst also studying for my PhD. So I guess the most main motivation for doing a PGC in teaching in general was that um, education has always been a real focus point in me when I, during my childhood. Um, my parents weren't educated, and 
they always re the importance of education was always um, very strong, and I wanted to be able to make the difference to young people's lives, especially from a disadvantaged background. Um, so to understand education fully and to move on within it, I wanted to be able to have a good contextual knowledge of being in the classroom. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, for me, there was uh, two motivations. Um, one was a sort of professional motivation, if you like, that I'd uh, worked on education policy, higher education policy, for most of my career, 10 years um, up to that point. And I was kind of a bit worried that I didn't really know what I was talking about, and I wanted to confirm um, that I did, in fact, um, know that. Uh, so that was coming to, so coming to the IOE was to sort of to help test that and, and to look into things in more depth and really get a chance to, to pull apart the issues um, uh, more closely in a way that you couldn't do in, in the workplace sometimes. Um, and also there was a sort of family motivation. Um, my dad was not very well at the time and I wanted to kind of, he'd always been wanting to me to see, see me go into further education, so I uh, wanted to do that and sadly he passed away before I could complete the course. But for me it was an important thing to kind of show him that I was, I was doing the thing that he wanted me to do. Um, so I was pleased that I was able to, he knew that I'd started the course before, before that happened. Um, I think mine are slightly more selfish reasons, to be honest. I was um, pregnant with my second son, and throughout my pregnancy I had this burning question that was within me the whole time. And the question, once my son was born, then turned into fear, because I've got two black boys. And my fear was that nobody was going to see my children the way that I saw them. And having been in education, been a teacher for, at that point, about 13 years, I was quite aware of some of the challenges that children face from all sorts of backgrounds and disadvantage. So as a parent, I wanted to know, are my fears correct or am I just blowing things out of proportion? So I had this question and, and throughout my pregnancy and then I was reading all sorts of books and then found that the authors that I was reading were the lecturers at the IOE. So I thought, well, that's where I need to do my master's. I need an answer to this question. And the interesting thing is, although I did it for very selfish reasons, it's actually framed everything that I've done since, all the roles that I've had since, and the role that I have now across Step Academy Trust, comes back to all the time. What's the context of your learners? Therefore, what's the content of your curriculum? And how should you be shaping education for them in light of what we know are some of the unsaids in education about the disadvantages that children face and some of the things that we don't say out loud to actually face that and then actually do something about it? Thank you. Gosh, well, that's given us a real um, brilliantly diverse range of motivations from the emotional, practical, and, and also including um, the career motivations, but also around commitments to social justice, which is, of course, something that we take very seriously uh, in our mission at the IOE. Um, I wonder if you could talk, each of you, a little bit about um, perhaps some... Um, any surprises that you had through your learning and um, important lessons that you can share with colleagues here today. So that's, that's twofold uh, elements of your answers, lessons and surprises. And we'll start at this end this time, Janice. Okay. Um, so the, the lessons that I, I learned from the actual masters that I did um, was about the fact that um, there's a lot of, lot of literature out there, there's lots of um, research out there and, and far too often education, and it's changed now, thankfully, um, is that we don't actually review the literature, we don't talk about the research that's out there and use that to inform decisions that we have. Um, so it, it helped me to understand how much more I, I needed to engage and therefore uh, anyone I worked with, enable them to engage and, and talk about the literature that actually exists um, within, within education so we can use that to inform some of our decisions and, and, and shape some of the things that we actually try to put in place. What's the second part? Surprises, I think. Surprises. Um, surprises had to do with the fact that obviously after you've had a baby, maybe it's not the best time to go into a <laughs> master's, and that if you know it's starting on a Wednesday evening, express more milk um, than you probably thought you needed. Um, but also surprises in terms of how accessible the lecturers are here, the professors are, um, those who have done doctorates and so on, that you can, you can go and knock on someone else's door. I remember speaking to Barbara and Felicity Armstrong. They were actually the course directors there, but, but they were down the corridors. So these people whose books I was reading, they were at my fingertips, and that was the most richest experience. But as well as the fact that um, I was surprised to find there were lots of international students who had similar questions to mine about inclusive education from a different standpoint, but there were key threads that were quite similar. So, so those are a couple of things. Thank you. David? Yeah, a, a lot uh, I would echo in, in, in that in, in the terms of my experience. I mean, I think for me, the lessons 
um, that I learned really was that it's some, you really will stretch yourself. Um, you know, the, the, the great thing about the IOE courses are they are such high caliber, and, I, and, and for me certainly it was a case of finding myself tested at times and, and, and sort of staring at the computer going, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and, uh, but that was all part of the learning journey and it, it was really, really important to do that and, and to really feel that you were, you were gaining something from the process. Um, and for me, working in a policy environment, it, what, the other thing that was really great was learning more about marshalling arguments and, and how to sort of get across the point that you're trying to make to build um, what you're trying to, to say through the essay writing, the dissertation writing process, which was, uh, again, a really, really useful skill that um, I got. Um, and you'll find that also you usually will have much more to say than you think. So if you get daunted by the word targets, don't, because actually the problem will be you'll have too much and you'll have to cut stuff um, because there'll be so many interesting things that you'll want to say about the topics. Um, the other lesson I learned was to, to sort of, uh, you know, look to see what others have done. So my friend Hannah had done um, this course a couple of years before I did, and I kept going back to her dissertation, not to copy it, um, in, the, in the library, but it was, I knew it was a good dissertation, and I, I was able to go back and say, what did Hannah do um, in her uh, documents, and, and that really helped um, me to sort of be sure that I was kind of on track with what I was doing. And I think the surprises for me was just the, how technologically advanced it was, which doesn't sound likely for the sort of classroom-based courses, but it was, it was the, um, there was, again, the access that you got to this huge amount of kind of online uh, journals and uh, sometimes online books and, uh, you, you know, the kind of things that you can get uh, and some of the, the interactive teaching methods that was used was, it was a real surprise for, for someone who'd been to university in the 90s when, um, you know, we were still able to submit handwritten essays and things. Um, uh, so, and, yeah, and also the access you get, and you mentioned that in your opening speech, to all these libraries, not just in uh, IOE and UCL, but um, in Senate House, uh, in the LSE, I was able to go and use their, their, their library because all the other University of London libraries let you use theirs, and so that was really great, um, and having access to all this knowledge, it was, it was brilliant. Any surprises? Oh, was oh that, that, was, that, was, that was the surprise, yeah. Um, so yeah so definitely. Definitely. No, Thank no. you. Thank you. Um, so I, I started my PGC straight after I left university, so I feel like everything that happened in that year was a lesson. Um, but mostly, I suppose, I, I, become, I became a very reflective person. Um, and that's as a teacher, but also as a student, like really thinking about how to apply what you're learning to the context you're within, but also how to challenge yourself to be better and not feel like every mistake you make is the end of the world, but um, something to learn from. So that was the biggest lesson I probably took out of one, the PGC year, but also starting my teaching career. Um, the biggest surprise, probably um, how easy, yeah, how accessible uh, the tutors and professional um, mentors were here, but also um, how, how much teaching has changed since I was a student myself and how quickly it continues to change. Um, so much is always happening and it's really interesting to try and keep up with all the time, but also a challenge. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, I think one of the most important lessons was the huge benefit of working collaboratively and discussing your ideas with a range of colleagues whose experiences differ from your own. So for me, reading widely broadened my understanding of key sh issues and also allowed me to critique my own teaching practice. Um, the studying for my master's put me in the place of the student. So, you know, the panic that perhaps you may, a student may feel in your classroom when you ask an unfamiliar question, I could relate to that. Mm -hmm. And so that was I was able to take that to my day-to-day -day practice. Um, what surprised me, how much I enjoy studying and how much time you can put into something that you enjoy doing, the time just flew by for me. And um, I was working full-time and studying part-time, but as I said, you know, time flies when you're having fun, and I was having fun. Well, that's really lovely to hear. I mean, I think that this uh, love of study is coming through very strongly from you all. And of course, especially for those of you who may be doing this on top of your day job um, or, or with other uh, responsibilities and commitments, of course, the additional study, you know, it can be challenging pragmatically uh, and logistically, but this passion for learning is coming through very strongly from all of you. And of course, that's incredibly enriching. Um, I think the other thing that's enriching about um, IOE study, on the, particularly on our master's programmes, is the uh, international nature. Um, both, you, you know, you're hearing from uh, students and colleagues from across the world, but also about the workings of different education systems and different ways of life, um, which I, as in my previous roles as a lecturer, have learned so much from as well. 
Um, so that can be incredibly stimulating, but also give you that sense of perspective, uh, which is critically important too. And just lastly then, um, before we turn to the audience, maybe I can ask you each to say something about how you have uh, addressed that challenge of balancing your study and other commitments, and if there's anything that you want to um, say about your present career in relation to that as well, of course, do feel free. Um, so Priya, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's difficult. <laughs> and I, I found that I had to give myself um, so, as I said, I was stud studying for my PhD at the same time as teaching full-time. Um, so, I found that I needed to give myself my weekends, which, as a teacher, that can be a very difficult task. But even if that meant late nights um, during the week, just so that I had something to look forward to on the weekend, that's how I decided to prioritise. Um, and, yes, yeah. Thank you. David. Um, yeah, very similar. I, I, I did my master's part-time over two years, and it was, uh, I, again, I think the thing about the IOE, again, it's quite professionally focused, so it's very much structured for people in professional practice, I think, to come do evening classes so that you can do your day job. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of expectation on, on what you have to produce and so on, um, you can kind of fit in at the weekends and the evenings. Um, I was very lucky to have a very supportive employer and a supportive husband uh, who gave me lots of tea. Um, whilst I was doing things, and uh, but the uh, it, one of the other things I found was that I actually drank less whilst I was not that I'm, not that I'm terrible, but um, <laughs> but it was the, to order to concentrate, and especially on this sort of essay writing process, um, I, I found that I just had to leave alcohol alone. So it was also um, quite healthy uh, doing study as well. So that was good. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I had to treat it like a military operation, to be honest with you, um, and also not be afraid to ask for help. I think. You, you can go through through life sometimes thinking you, you're just going to battle through by yourself and everything's going to be fine. But I think if you're really passionate about, about study and you want to balance it off with your other commitments, and I had two children, a husband, and, and, and a job. Um, no, actually, I was on maternity, so it's fine. Um, that I had to really think about, okay, so, so when do I need to be at the IOE? What day do I need to be there? So who's going to pick up who? Um, what time will that be? I also need a break myself. I don't want to come back home to do the cooking. Who's doing the cooking on a Tuesday night? So literally mapping everything out because I didn't want to pretend it was just going to happen. It was going to be easy because I knew I was actually putting something into my, my life that probably wasn't supposed to be there just then. But I wanted it to be, so I had to make it work. Um, so I learned to ask and say, I need help and I can't do this by myself, and so what are you going to do to help me? And, and you know, I had my mum and my neighbour and everybody else helping, and, and then calling up and saying, actually, I want to stay in the library because I, I want to stay here late because I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing. Can someone pick up X and, and cook dinner, please? So I think you just have to be really pragmatic. Because if, if you want to do something passionately enough, then you've got to make the space for it. Um, so you've got to go for it. And um, I think the next part of your question is something about our own role now as well. Um, and I've found that Weaving in the study still continues for me, although I'm not doing a master's or any other, um, although I want to do a PhD soon. Um, but you, you weave in the reading and the literature because you know that it enriches your life and your conversation as well. So that's really benefited me in, in the current role that I have because then it becomes quite infectious and you've got the whole culture of people around you who are also reading and researching and wanting to improve practice um, as well as leadership and development. Thank you, and brilliant to hear that you're planning the PhD as well, <laughs> and Valerie. Yeah, I think I'll just echo what my colleagues have said, really. I think it's about forward planning, prioritising my workload, same focus and planning ahead. So where you know that the master's programmes is so well structured, you know what assignments are due and when they're going to happen. You can coincide that with parents' evenings, data drops, and it's just trying to keep all the plates spinning, I think, is the best way of putting it. Um, and just making sure that your colleagues at work are aware of you know, the times where you are going to have that extra pressure. Um, and they were, in my case, were really, really, really supportive. So that's what I would say. Those are excellent tips. Thank you, colleagues. Um, well, I think we should turn to the uh, audience and see if people have questions. Um, these can be as practical or, or, or as esoteric as you like. It could be about the nature of the study or, or how it was managed. Um, have we got anybody with mics? Uh, Andy, that's wonderful, thank you. And we'll take um, a collection of questions. If you could say uh, who you are, where you're from, and then uh, put your question. I'll take a few of them, um, and then we'll answer in clusters. Hi, my name is Silvia. I'm from Brazil. And uh, I would like to know if the PGC um, for secondary school 
can be done part-time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any other questions? Everyone's reticent at the moment. Lady here. Yes, hello. Um, I, I should probably say first um, where I'm from. Um, I've been working with refugees for the last 20 years, currently doing outreach for Jesuit Refugee Service. And um, my question was more general. I noticed that you have a social justice and education masters. And is that something that ties into all the degrees that you offer here at, um, at UCL? Or is that, you know, very specific? It's a really good question. Uh, wonderful. My name is Kirsten. I wanted to ask that if you've already applied for a full-time program, or maybe even started a full-time master's program here, what happens if by chance you get a, a full-time job? And can you then convert in the middle of that program into a part-time program? Is that something that is easy to do? And will you allow that? Thank you very much. Thanks, audience. Let's, answer, let, let's take a few answers and then we'll come round to um, further questions. Um, first of all, in terms of the pragmatic questions, the, um, the question about um, whether the PGCE can be taken part-time and the conversion mid-programme, I don't think colleagues here are going to be able to answer those, th those particular questions. Um, uh, I and my job, you know, I'm, I'm um, sort of managing the whole ship, as it were, rather than knowing the details of the programmes. But that's exactly what our colleagues outside are waiting to be able to tell you. So do please take up those questions with the particular uh, programme lead. So you... One, one quick thing I would say is if you're funded through Student Finance England or any of the kind of UK-based uh, funding bodies, um, conversion from one... Uh, mode of study to another full time to part time or, or vice versa might have an impact on your student finance. So the other thing to say is if you do do that, um, get some advice from the Student Advice Centre in UCL or the Student Union um, to make sure that that doesn't cause you any problems. Yeah. And just to add in a sort of general way there, um, what I would say is that we try to be as flexible as we can be. So in terms of the being able to sort of change mode part way through and so forth, uh, certainly we would try our best to accommodate those, those, those questions. Um, but as I say, if you have this, those specific questions, do take them up with colleagues outside. Um, they are very well prepped to be able to answer them. Um, in relation to the question about um, social justice and the masters in social justice, um, of course, that course will be um, particularly focused and foregrounding those issues. You know, that will, uh, will be the really tight conceptual area of focus. But nevertheless, you're absolutely right to spot uh, that uh, at UCL more broadly, um, but long-standingly at the IOE as well, um, social justice and making our public services and, and, and by extension the world a better and fairer place really underpin all that we try to do. Um, so that theme will tend to infuse all our courses. Thanks. Any more questions? Good evening. Um, my name's Emily. Um, I'm living in London and I'm working in um, a secondary school in Camden at the moment. Um, my main question is about um, what you said about making space. Um, and I guess, did you feel supported by the staff and the students um, in terms of carving out space in your personal life? in terms of like balancing, like spinning the plates, that kind of thing. Great question. Hi, uh, my name's Jess, I'm from London. Um, I was actually interested in knowing about sort of course content in terms of, I'm thinking of doing the PGCE in um, secondary, and in terms of national curriculum versus like global perspectives and how maybe these courses have helped you uh, on an international level or looking outside of the UK? Thank you. That 
Hello, um, my name is Charlotte. I'm also thinking of applying for the PGC. Um, I was just going to ask about the changes you said you saw to the school system even since you were in it. I've also felt, I mean, I haven't been out of it for that long, but it's, al it's already massively changed. I wanted to ask what you thought the main changes were in, in schools and then how it affects the students. Wonderful. Well, let's take those questions. And um, who would like to answer the question about making space and what support you got? Any takers? Um, so when I decided to do my master's, um, that was something that was on my professional development and the head teacher was in support of that. So where I was actually doing some research for my final dissertation, it would overall benefit my school. So that's how I was able to, to carve out the time with the support of my colleagues, because they knew ultimately that it would contribute to development of the school, um, which it did. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say on that one. Thank you. Thanks, Valerie. Anyone else wanted to add anything there about practical tips? Uh, I just, I mean, I, for me, obviously, it's a, it was a, it, an extreme uh, example in a way, but I had the bereavement, as I mentioned, in the middle of the course, and the um, institute was really understanding about that and helped. I moved a module around, basically, so I did it kind of on the end of my, my master's, in effect, um, rather than in the, the sort of normal pattern of it, but to, to basically um, account for the fact that, you know, I needed to take some time out so that the institute was really, really understanding of that and helpful in that situ situation, which I hope none of you encounter, but if you do, then... Um, it, they were great. Thank you, David. Thanks for sharing that as well. Um, so then there was a question from Jess about the, um, the national curriculum um, versus sort of global experiences and so forth on PGCE. Did anyone um, feel able to answer that? I just say that there was a strong focus, of course, on the UK curriculum because that's what you'll be teaching. But what you'll find is that you can apply that to most global experiences. I, I work in global pedagogy at the moment and everything that I learned within my PhD is relevant still. I think that's a, the point's really well made. I mean, the PGCE remains very crammed. You know, we know in this country, um, teacher education is a very crammed timetable. And I'm really glad I, I, I was involved in the early, teach, early career framework that will be um, supporting professional development for early career teachers after they finish their teacher education, because we all know that it's a very tight time scale. Um, but I think you, you know, the fact that you are operating in an internationalised context here at the IOE um, and that that infuses um, the experiences of your lecturers and so on, uh, is, it will, will be beneficial in that way too. Did anyone else have anything to add? Or? Good. And then the, the third question was about um, the uh, present situation in schools and social policy, right? Say anything there? Yeah, um, so the question was was it around the impact of social issues in, within education? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'd agree, and it is rapid, but, but I think what's what I'm noticing more of now is that there's, there's a greater conversation about curriculum and about um, what is it that children should be learning and when, but more importantly, how are we going to do that? How should we be developing pedagogues um, within our society, within our schools and so on? And what should we be using to inform that? So I think it's a much richer debate than, than we've had previously. And there's a real movement across the piece, whether it's primary or secondary schools, where people are really engaging with what are the different strategies we could be using, but actually why are we using that one? And is that right for our school, for our context, for our children? Um, and, and what are others doing? So it's creating that sort of co-creation of a curriculum as opposed to just an isolated view on it as well. So I, I think things are moving quickly, but I think they're moving with the right instruments this time. So we're taking where it's evidence-informed practice as opposed to what was gone on before, which was, well, I've been doing it like this for years, so why not just continue? And actually now let's really question what we're doing and why we're doing it and is it in the right vein and, and, and who else is experiences can we draw upon to make that the richest experience for the children and because it's their education and that, that really counts but also it's not just about the outcomes in terms of what certificates I might go away with what sort of learners are we wanting to create what sort of thinkers are we creating for when they move on from us and and become the adults that, that, that are going to determine our futures eventually thanks Janice did anyone else want to come in 
Good. Well, I, I, I can say a, a couple of things there. I mean, I think that um, certainly we had huge amounts of policy churn in um, education in the last 30 years, and schools and head teachers have become very adept to quickly responding and so on to every new policy demand. Thankfully, I think that now the government has really recognised, even just in the last couple of years, the detrimental impact that that has had, the, the, the heavy accountability regime has had um, on teacher recruitment, on teacher retention, um, but really teacher well-being. And things are quite radically changing, I would say. I think the early careers framework is one indication of that, but also there really has been um, a sort of stepping back um, from policy makers um, and recognition it, it, with Ofsted as well that um, things need to be changed and looked at afresh. And I think Janice is absolutely right to say that there has been much more of a turn to the profession to be forging its own identity and how it wants to take things forward, uh, which I think is a real opportunity. The other um, issue around um, change that we're seeing, of course, is an enormous amount of debate around um, student mental health, for example, and whether this is contextualised by the rapid changes in um, uh, digital um, and, and, and online uh, worlds that our students are occupying. Um, and I think that in terms of the kind of changes that we see going forward, there's a lot of debate about whether ed tech can support uh, new pedagogic delivery and exciting developments in education, or whether actually digitalization is actually a sort of problem mm -hmm. and something that schools need to defend young people from. And that debate, I would say, is absolutely live um, in, in schools and the education system at the moment. So I think that from both those elements, um, what you would be entering, uh, for those of you who are, who are interested in teaching, um, and, and developing teaching is a really uh, stimulating uh, environment in a time of opportunity and change, a time of challenge too, of course, um, but one where I think for the first time in a long time, teachers are at the forefront of these professional conversations about the way forward. Mm. And we've probably got time for a very short last round of questions, if people have burning yet. Hi, uh, I'm Chris. Um, <clears throat> regarding the uh, PGCE um, qualification with primary mathematics as a specialism, I'd like to ask some of the uh, more experienced teachers on the panel there, um, how much of your working day would be dedicated towards uh, maths lessons, and how much of it would be dedicated towards the other subjects? Because from what I understand, I believe you still teach all of the subjects if you, if you have this qualification. I'd just like to know how much time would be dedicated in the classroom towards maths lessons if you had this qualification. Thank you. Thank you. And this gentleman here at the front. Um, I'm Alex, I'm from Newcastle, um, and I don't want to kind of enforce my career plans on you guys, but I just noticed that a lot of you are in sort of the administration of education now, rather than um, on the front lines, as it were. And I was wondering if any of you thought about doing an MBA, and if the MA was appropriate preparation for that. That's helpful. And uh, just one more over here, I think. Hi, I'm Sally. Um, I'm interested in doing the early education um, MA. Um, I'm currently a primary school teacher and I've been for quite a long time. Um, is the, my issue would be juggling two children and a full-time uh, teaching job. Is there a benefit to doing, uh, is, it, is the weekly attendance and weekends for the MA or is there a benefit to doing it online? Um, with, is the content the same or 
um, is it ever so slightly different? Good questions, thank you. Um, so, first of all, um, the PGC maths. I guess I don't know if anyone um, actually took maths, but I guess the question is about how much uh, subject, specific subject focus there is mm. uh, compared to the more generalist elements. Can anyone answer that? Yeah. Um, so, I'm just thinking about across the trust. So, we, we've got um, 15 primary schools, and it depends a lot on. Um, the focus of the school. So there are some, some primary schools whereby they'll just have the specialist teachers. So a specialist for math, specialist for science, specialist for English and so on. And so therefore a, a bulk of your time would just be on mathematics. But there are others where, yes, say for example in the morning you'll teach mathematics, but then for the rest of the day you'll teach other elements of the curriculum. So whether it's um, science or geography or humanities um, or ICT. So it could be that a fifth of your day is to do with mathematics. It could be that half of your day is to do with mathematics. It just depends on which school you go for. Um, equally, it depends on whether or not you're teaching in, in, in the early years or, or key stage one or, or key stage two, if it's primary that is, is your background. So, for example, if you are a year six mathematics teacher, then more of your day would be based on, on mathematics because you're more likely to have those groups at that time because you'll be the specialist within the school. So a lot of it comes down to how the, the leadership team or the head teachers decided to... Um, to map out the curriculum and also whether or not they've decided that specialists only will teach certain subjects or if they want you to also have the general understanding. And I think, to be honest, for a practitioner it's better to have, in primary anyway, the balance of the other subjects as well because then you get to understand about how the children are learning across the curriculum, not just in, within one subject area. Thank you. And Valerie, you studied uh, maths education, I think. Did you have anything to say? I think Janice has really said everything. Because my background was in secondary mathematics, I think all of my day was teaching maths. And so that's what I, I found my personal experience. Thank you very much. OK. Um, and then we had a question about MBA versus MA. Anyone uh, want to comment on that? Uh, I mean, I can briefly cover in that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not in a sort of management. The MBA was very much focused. Uh, so the MA that I did in higher professional education, what happened was a lot of the people doing the MBA um, for universities crossed over with the modules. So because again, you, there's certain core modules that you do as part of the MA program, um, and then you have a selection of other M of modules that you can do, um, um, which is great. I and mean, that was one of the, the, the best bits about coming here was the, the kind of range of things you could do. And what you found was a lot of the MBA um, candidates came into the same classes. So we had one on economics of education, for instance, and there was quite a lot of MBA um, uh, sort of students that were in that. So it's an inter so does it prepare you? Yes, because actually you're studying a lot of the same uh, part of the curriculum, really. And, and if you came back to do the MBA, it would just be doing another set of those modules alongside, obviously, whatever the core modules were for that. So um, yes, in short, it does, I think. Thanks, David. That's helpful. <coughs> and um, the last question was about um, basically the struggles with uh, work-life balance and whether um, the, um, the, 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 there is the same similar content in different types of mode, um, direct delivery or online and so forth. Does anyone have experience of that? Not really. I think you might have to ask outside. Again, colleagues will be very helpful for you and, um, to be able to talk about what the blended learning looks like online and so forth and how that works. Um, that's probably um, a timely way for me to say that we must finish. Thanks so much to you all for coming and for your attention. And thanks so much to our panelists for sharing their experiences with us and exemplifying, I think, the sort of dynamic professionals that, um, and that, that you can apply your qualifications for. So thanks. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. on that particular question. Anyone who would particularly like to uh, volunteer? Elaine, you look as if you wanted to start <laughs> us off. Okay, not, not being put on the spot. Um, so I was thinking um, a couple of questions about how research influences teaching and, has res and how research um, has, uh, that I've conducted has changed approaches to teaching. Um, and I think research influences teaching a great deal, um, and in all sorts of ways. Um, I'm particularly interested in sort of, I'm a qualitative researcher, I'm very interested in participatory approaches um, to research. 
and I'm equally interested in participatory approaches to teaching and learning. And I think, I think engaging with both of those um, in, in the two different spheres of research and teaching and learning means that perhaps uh, approaching teaching in a way that doesn't make assumptions about, about what students and learners already know and think about particular themes and topics and issues, but actually um, applies an approach which enables you to start from where they're at, start from where they understand the world and the way they understand particular issues, and then seek to build on that. So I think that's quite important. Um, I think for teachers, incorporating research into teaching is good for us. It gives us confidence in terms of what we bring to the learning space and helps make content topical and up-to-date. Um, I also think that our experiences from conducting research enable us to think about critical thinking about the layers and complexity of how particular issues and topics play out in the real world and how they differ between different contexts. It keeps us grounded in, in what we know and what we think we know um, and, and make us take account of the fact that the world is constantly changing and therefore our knowledge needs to change and shift with it. Um, and, think, and I think for students, finally, it provides access to cutting edge research and knowledge and insights and ideas into conducting their own research from maybe literature reviews or doing their own field research. Um, and they can learn from first hand experiences about the strengths and limitations of certain approaches um, and, and designs in, in terms of generating new knowledge. Um, last term, for example, we launched a new module on understanding education research and education international development. And that really gave an opportunity for us across the Center for Education and International Development for everybody to contribute to that. Talk about different methods and approaches and designs to research, but building on and using really concrete examples of the research that they were already conducting in lots of different international development fields. So, Thank yeah. you very much, Elaine. Rupert, how does that play out in the field of uh, applied leadership? Um, oh, well, let's see. Um, my research partly has been around um, values-led school improvement, and I've had the um, privilege over the years to work with a senior colleague, um, Professor Tony Booth, who um, who um, authored the Index for Inclusion on the basis of conversations with teachers, students, and parents around the world. Uh, and the purpose of that book and the framework that it, that it builds is to help all stakeholders of a school community to respond together to the question, how should we live together? And what do we need to know to live together well? And um, my involvement with him in using that practical framework for thinking through values and putting them into action in the minutiae of how we live in schools. Um, not only has that, that framework itself provided an invaluable source of, of material and a focus for my own teaching, but, it, but the interactions I've had through it um, with, with teachers, students and the like have helped shape me um, as a teacher as well as a researcher and I bring to, hopefully, to the rest of my work. Jeff, in the world of uh, educational technology, how, how does uh, research and, and the nexus between research and uh, teaching apply? So the, the, the point that Elaine made about um, sharing cutting-edge research with uh, students at, at all levels uh, is, is very important. Um, and that research may be uh, sort of hot off the press, or it may even not have been published yet. Uh, and by sharing that uh, at this very early stage, I think we as researchers also have an opportunity to, uh, to get feedback from our students uh, on those ideas. We can bounce ideas off uh, students and see what, um, what they make of it. Um, we do a lot of research, as uh, Norbert said, in the area of educational technology and uh, the role of technology in uh, communication. And we've done a lot of research in that area. We um, have built an international reputation uh, uh, on that. Uh, and uh, it's taken us some time, actually, to build um, a research or a module specifically on that. Uh, and we've got that running for three years now. Um, and it's been extremely uh, popular. So that's an example of a module that was built 
directly on research that, um, that we are known for in uh, the world of uh, education and technology. Tajendra, in your area. Um, I think research and teaching uh, are inseparable. I think um, I work in conflict-affected contexts and uh, the global challenges today that we face, um, unless we really engage in the field and talk to the people who have been affected by conflict, mass displacement, and other types of emergencies, um, it is very difficult to um, theorize these issues and uh, to actually talk about these things with, with students in the, in the class. Um, so what we really do is to um, bring in the, the current issues, the current crisis, um, through a rigorous process of uh, research um, into the class, which our students really um, sort of uh, appreciate. But also at the same time, I think it's very important to inform our curriculum designed through the research process. For example, um, in Lebanon that we work, um, we are designing a, a teacher professional development uh, curriculum uh, through massive online uh, open course by engaging with the teachers on the ground, uh, the, the range of experiences they're, uh, they're having and the difficulties that they face um, in the field, and we are bringing those experiences um, through the means of media, videos, and uh, podcasts, and uh, um, you know, narratives and stories, and designing a curriculum through, through that process. So it's a kind of a direct link between the research that is carried out which actually leads to the design of the, of the curriculum. Thank you very much, Jendra. Chloe, you've been uh, leading uh, teaching and learning at departmental level I have, yes. uh, for some time. Maybe you could, in your answer, try and show how uh, we, we're trying to go beyond the uh, personal uh, approaches uh, uh, to uh, teaching as informed by research and try and do that more systemically at departmental level as well. I'm not sure that I fully understood your question, but I think that the Department of Psychology uses very different research methods to the methods that we've heard about um, so far from the panel. So a lot of us are experimental psychologists, and one of the things that we make an effort to do in our lectures is to bring in the experimental tasks that we ourselves use in our research in order that students can actually see how the data that we work with are collected and so that when they're reading research papers in the field, they've seen the tasks that are being discussed. Um, so we've had a concerted effort at departmental level to make sure that the, the tasks and the methods that we're using in our own research come into the classroom. Students get a chance to try them out and they see how that knowledge is created. It gives them a hand-on experience in working out what the limitations might be, what the strengths might be, um, how tasks can be adapted to different audiences, I'm not sure if that's the answer yes, that you wanted, but that's an example of the sort of thing that we've been thinking of at departmental level in order to capitalise on the research strengths that, that we have. Thank you very much. And uh, Stuart, you run an important centre here uh, at uh, the IOE. What role does uh, research play there? Yeah, for, for the last 10 years, we've, we've really much, um, as my colleagues have suggested, uh, seen the direct relationship between research and, and teaching. Uh, we work with teachers across, across the UK um, since 2009. 11,000 teachers have been on our, our programs. And um, we, have, we have 111 beacon schools, satellite schools, out uh, ar around the country. Um, we have an online master's program, which we have huge amounts of teachers that go on. And so there's an obligation, I think, to make sure that our research informs practice, informs the development of our program in all kinds of ways. And so the most specific example to, to answer the question is um, in, in 2016, we, we produced this 274-page um, report, which is focused on the replies of 10,000 11 to 18-year-olds. Um, so it's a massive study, mixed method study, 288 interviews with young people as well. And, and that helped us understand what some of the issues that exist in young people's understanding of the Holocaust uh, and the kind of sense they make of the contemporary world as a result of that understanding. And that's helped to inform and shape our, the way we, we, we develop our professional development. It's helped to shape our relationship with schools, and very much in a collaborative way. We don't <coughs> go to schools and say, the research says this, therefore, as teachers, you need to do this. We work with them in a collaborative way to develop curriculum materials, resources, pedagogic practice, 
And so the centre for, we've been in a very privileged position for 10 years now, we've been able to think very carefully about um, the research, and we've done research with over 2,000 teachers recently, we're conducting a large scale study at the moment, and that research really underpins everything we do in terms of our, our, our practice in, in our relationship with teachers. So <coughs> in, in overarching terms, that's how the relationship, it's the explicit relationship between teaching and, and research. Thank, thank you very much. Jeff, when we first met, I think, uh, you worked uh, on a research project that looked specifically <coughs> at uh, the improvement uh, of taught provision uh, here at the IOE. Would you like to maybe uh, say a little bit about that experience, what we did and how it influenced and impacted uh, on curriculum design and pedagogy? A long time ago, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes, so that was uh, an example of a, a piece of research that, um, that followed directly from our own teaching experiences. So at the time, um, uh, colleagues had um, been working on an online um, uh, master's program and we were very keen to explore the experiences of students uh, learning online as opposed to um, the traditional face-to-face -face, uh, mode of delivery. Um, so we did um, a, a study on that, um, which has, uh, has helped us then uh, reshape the way in which that <coughs> online provision uh, uh, was, was organized. And we've got something similar going on in, uh, in, in a program that I'm involved in now, where we are seeing uh, a significant increase in student numbers uh, and a lot of international students. And that, again, has raised all sorts of questions for us that we are now beginning to uh, research, so how, how to deal with uh, large groups uh, in, in, in terms of teaching, how to uh, take into consideration the fact that our students come uh, from uh, many different parts of the world, how can we best respond to that? So there are all questions that, uh, that are actually raised by um, or, or from that come from our own direct experiences that lead to research and that research then uh, feeds into uh, the development of our curriculum and pedagogy. And moving across back to uh, you, um, Elaine, uh, what sort of pedagogical research uh, would you be uh, using to inform your own practice? Or have you indeed yourself carried out pedagogical research uh, to, to, to help you inform your practice? I think the most current current work, excuse me, is is the um, work that I'm currently working on is uh, the example that Tijendra gave where we're actually working um, in the field in Lebanon um, and then looking at the sorts of support that um, teachers require to um, work in very difficult contexts. Um, and again, it takes us back to really start the starting, just to add to what Tijendra was saying, starting from where teachers are at, getting a better understanding of the context within which they're learning, the sorts of day-to-day -day challenges that they're facing, but also capturing some really exciting and innovative practice, despite the constraints of their context and situations. And that's been such an exciting um, adventure and an exciting thing to do, but it, but it leads directly to supporting the teaching that's already going on, but then actually capturing that innovative practice and, and, and making it available much more widely to other teachers or educationalists globally, really. Thank you very much. Chloe, in the field of psychology and human development, what, what types of research bases uh, would you be uh, trying to uh, foster at that departmental level to feed into your teaching? Oh, gosh, that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> I can't think of any particular examples other than we're just influenced generally by the idea that there needs to be a science of learning. So the way that we teach does need to be driven by what we know about how students learn. I mean, I guess we're all in the position of teaching here students who are themselves teachers who come with ideas about how they learn best but who also are learning often under quite challenging circumstances. So often they're coming to study 5.30 to 8.30 in the evening. They've been busy during the day. They may have caring responsibilities. So we have a concerted effort to try and teach in a way that is really going to engage our students, not only through the way we organize our activities, but through the way that we draw on their professional experience. So we're incredibly fortunate that the students we teach have a wide range of professional experience and absolute wealth of experience. And so we try and think about how we can capitalize on that and engage students in sharing. We say to our students that 
you know, we're not really the experts, it's the students who are the experts. We're trying to draw out that expertise and encourage them to share that. Um, that might not be the exact answer you're no, looking for. But, uh, th thank, thank you very much. Rupert, do you, do you want to uh, consider that question as well? Yeah, I'm um, happy to follow on on that theme, really. I had the um, uh, privilege a few years ago to work with a large team from um, Cambridge <coughs> and Mexico on creating what was essentially a typology for productive talk moves based on uh, analysis of classroom dialogue in many classrooms in many countries. Um, and that th brought together much of the literature and around the theory of um, dialogue, but also with lots and lots and reams of empirical evidence. And a, a, a three-year dialogue ensued out of which uh, um, a coding scheme and a typology um, uh, emerged. And that, is, that remains constantly in development, but the process of having gone through that and analyzed hundreds of conversations and coded them, um, really, I, I, I'd like to think, gives me pretty good insight onto um, what um, productive educational dialogue really sounds like. And, but, the, but for me, it's not just about then, as a researcher being able, and a teacher, being able to code that and try and make it and orchestrate it, though that's important, but it's actually then sharing the, that knowledge with students so that they can see as teachers um, what it would mean to, um, for example, um, it, so if they see a student acknowledge a change of mind, for example, which is one of those you know, 33 codes, to be able to stop and recognize the profound importance of a moment in a conversation where that actually happens, or to have one student ask another, uh, uh, ask another to elaborate on what they had said previously or provide additional examples in support of their idea. Once you start to, once you know what some of those moves are, and you start to become more aware and more literate in, um, in both um, observing them and encouraging them, um, I think that can have a profound um, pedagogical impact, and I, so that's work I really enjoy sharing. Thank you very much. Stuart, you've talked earlier on about <coughs> the way in which you used research to inform the work of the center. What about the other way around, in terms of uh, the teaching that uh, you've been carrying out uh, over the years? How's that sort of uh, informed your perspective on uh, research? Well, I think, I think, in keeping with what others have said, I think it's the, the teachers are helping inform us about what settings the research agenda is. So I think that, that's quite an interesting uh, dimension to the work. As an example, um, we work Every year we work with 20 schools, um, which we call beacon schools, and across the country. So we go out and work with them, they come to the institute and work with us, and, and we, we develop uh, schemes of work, curriculum, um, and pedagogical practice in, in consort with them. And every school's different, the contexts are different, and it shapes their, their, their learning, as one would imagine, in a different ways. But what we're seeing in the recent years is a trend in, in, in the field where, whereby um, teachers are telling us that actually the challenges in their school are beyond understanding the Holocaust, and they relate to issues like hate speech and hate crime and um, Islamophobia and homophobia and, and broader issues, cultural <coughs> issues. Um, and they, they're raising lots of, lots of you know, challenges in an era of fake news and, and, and um, some, of the, some of the troubling discourse that's out there. And it's made us think very carefully about the teaching context and how do we address, what can we contribute and what, what uh, that, that, that the phrase that was just used, the productive educational dialogue, that we're working with teachers. So this, this again, this relationship between teaching and practice, and, and it helps inform our next research um, agenda. So we're, we're looking very carefully at young people's understandings of some of these issues and, and trying to, to, try to make sense of them. So that, again, will inform and enrich our, our teaching program. So again, it's this two-way process, which is, which is critical and ongoing. Tejendra, would you like to comment on that as well from your perspective, given the work that you do? Um, I think uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting um, sort of uh, research project that you described, a similar kind of work that I was, I was involved in, um, in Somaliland, um, where we were working with a, a partner university to design uh, an academic course on education, conflict, and peace building. Uh, we run a similar kind of program here, uh, we could have actually sat down with colleagues and developed that program and uh, delivered it, but we didn't want to do that way. So we took more sort of a research approach in uh, developing a curriculum. 
Um, so we carried out field work um, in, in Somaliland, talking to um, a lot of uh, political leaders, um, young people, um, academics, and uh, other cultural groups, uh, in order to really understand this notion of peace, uh, which is contextually meaningful in, in that particular context, and also to identify you know, key dimensions of uh, uh, history, um, social issues, clan-based issues, um, and also the way that uh, Somaliland society actually um, you know, saw itself moving forward. So we were able to capture all of that um, and uh, organized a curriculum development workshop with a broad range of stakeholders feeding into that process through the research. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually, then designing the course um, through that through that process, and some of the pedagogical practices that emerged out of that uh, uh, that process was quite, were quite uh, sort of non-conventional. For example, students were and and, and people on the, in the field were reporting that uh, we needed to include um, music and singing as part of the curriculum de delivery, because it was an important aspect of. Uh, promoting social cohesion, celebrating the culture, and promoting peace building. Um, so th that actually helped us rethink about our lecture-based conventional way of teaching and learning, that, that we need to be adaptive to the circumstances where we work in, So which is way, both ways, research informed our teaching, but also through teaching we were able to inform the research. Mm, thank you very much. Um, whilst uh, we all on this, at this table, probably involved in uh, research supervision. Uh, Jeff, you particularly mentioned the fact that you were. So can I start with you and, and ask you uh, what particular advice you might offer to uh, any prospective uh, research student uh, in, in your area who would want to research uh, educational uh, technology? Right, yeah, well, that's certainly one aspect of my work that I, I really enjoy, supervising uh, uh, master students' dissertations, uh, PhD uh, students' work, uh, because they give me insight in live worlds uh, that I'm not necessarily very familiar with. Uh, so I might have students looking at um, uh, discussion forums online for LGTB uh, young people in Taiwan. Uh, I might have a student looking at uh, teamwork during Formula One pit stops. Uh, I have uh, medical education uh, as, as another topic. Uh, and so I do learn a lot from students uh, that I uh, supervise. So I'm really grateful for them uh, to that. And of course, it is important that uh, there is a strong alignment between their interests and their approach to the topic and, and what I as a supervisor can, can offer. And we work really hard to ensure that there is such alignment uh, at the, uh, on the programs that I, that I work on. Uh, so we always organize um, uh, kind of uh, meetings where tutors uh, talk to students about the research that they're working on um, so that students can, uh, can try and connect to that uh, ongoing research um, when they think about designing their own uh, dissertation uh, research. Chloe, I know that your department is very proud of the uh, outputs that uh, your students produce, research outputs as part of dissertations, master's dissertations and so forth. Uh, do you want to speak a little <coughs> bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, we encourage all our students to think of themselves as researchers and part of that is introducing our students to research that our master's students have done in the past. So, for example, a lecture that I was giving last week where I was talking about some of my new research, which I'm starting off with. I had a wonderful student last year, a wonderful master's dissertation student last year, who did some very important pilot work towards that. Um, and so by encouraging students to find out about the work, the research work that other students have done, we hope to encourage all students to see themselves as researchers. Um, we're also very proud not only of the outputs that our students produce, but also that they come from so many different backgrounds. One of our doctoral students who is producing an absolutely superb um, piece of doctoral work told me the other day that he left school at 15 with no qualifications at all. But he brings such a wealth of professional experience and it's been wonderful to see himself during this doctoral journey, seeing himself as a researcher, becoming a researcher. 
Um, so we, we encourage our students at all levels, whether it's masters or, or doctorate, to, to see themselves as researchers. There are skills that they bring. Um, and we also, as, as research active staff, are very honest about where we learn from students. We're very honest about the weaknesses that we have, the gaps in our knowledge that we have. Um, one of the questions that actually, Norbert, you wanted us to think about was what aspects of teaching have impacted on our approach to research? And from a personal point of view, at a very basic level, um, obviously we're very fortunate in that we get to teach in our areas of expertise, but sometimes we have to teach topics that we don't know. And I had to give a lecture on how children learn words, how they learn the meanings of words, which was not something that I'd ever been interested in before. But having taught that lecture and having got such interested feedback from students, this is now an area that I research in and have a research collaboration with colleagues at UCL in. So we need to encourage students to see themselves as researchers, but also realize that there are a lot of things that we can, you know, as we've all said, that we can learn from students as well. Rupert, you told us earlier on that you work on an online program. How does that work on an online program? How can we foster research engagement uh, by students in an online environment? Well, um, I mean, I guess one of the things is our program is a, a strong focus on the application of, of what students learn. We expect them to be for this course in leadership positions in their educational institution. Sometimes that's schools, sometimes it's a catering college, um, other times it's in um, it's been um, in a um, working with um, displaced refugees also, and. Um, we, and the variety of student backgrounds means um, that we get some you know, extraordinary candidates who go on to do, um, who we're able to enable to do um, amazing things. So they learn through us on the master's program, but as, as it comes to the dissertation and the final year, having done four modules of more um, taught content, they have the chance to let rip, as it were, with their ideas and really make the links between what they've learned to date and, um, and the, the, mo the, the, the motivating and inspiring ideas that have stood out for them and then get to work with those as intellectual tools in the context in which they find themselves. And of course for us as um, you know, university-based lecturers, it's tremendously refreshing to work with educational leaders straight from the front line and to directly support them in their application of, uh, of um, knowledge to, um, to their group. So, um, um, and um, some, uh, another privilege of that sometimes is then to um, help or even co-write with them. So um, I've just finished, um, just heard, thankfully it's gonna be published as a chapter in International Handbook. Um, one of my master's students, um, who was a very unconfident writer at first and unconfident in himself as an academic, but by working with him, um, for two years and then in an ongoing partnership we um, turned his year-long study of, um, of leadership of pastoral care um, eventually into a chapter in a, in, a, in a highly renowned international publication and so my collaboration with him over four years first as a, a, as a, super, a teacher and supervisor and then as a co-writer was tremendously satisfying for me and I think for him. Elaine. Uh, you talked very passionately about your program earlier on. Maybe you could say a little bit about in what ways you think it is distinctive in terms of this uh, uh, research uh, pedagogy nexus. I think it's, just as a number of other people have said, I think what it brings is um, a huge wealth of experience already that, that people come. So it's an international, an education international development program that requires people when they come to it to have some experience of some sort of work in, in other contexts. And, um, and so what we have is we, we get together in, in, a, in a room with between 20, 30, maybe 40 students who have such a wealth of experience in terms of geographic scope, in terms of the kind of settings they've been working in, um, the approaches that they've taken to um, teaching and, and learning um, or research sometimes as well. And so you get this wonderful opportunity to, to, for sharing ideas and sharing approaches, sharing um, and, and, and a situation as a lecturer or teacher where you are constantly learning. Um, and that's really what, what, what I love about the, uh, about the work. Um, and there's, there's not a day goes by where I don't learn something fundamentally new that, that influences the way I think about things or the way I approach things. Um, and that makes it in, a, an incredibly exciting context to be working in. 
Thank you very much. Stuart, you talked in an earlier answer about the uh, very significant importance of the work that your centre does in terms of uh, uh, the society within which we live. Could you maybe uh, extrapolate from that more the, the, the role of the wider university in, 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 in terms of uh, uh, the way in which it can help through research and practice shape uh, the society within which we live? Yeah, I, I was... Um, <clears throat> I used to have the mission statement of UCL above my bed and I had it pinned there, but I, 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 I don't have it anymore. But I looked at it, I looked, up, looked it up this morning just to check that I was, I was uh, thinking very carefully about this. It. The UCL mission talks about education for the long-term benefit of humanity um, or engaging with the wider world and committing it, committed to changing it for the better. And they're, they're lofty goals, aren't they? Our, our, why we're here is to change, why the university's here is to change the world for the better. And I think they're important that we remind ourselves of that privilege we have to work in a university that allows us to engage in areas which potentially can make a difference in various ways. And of course, a university like UCL, in terms of medical research, you know, issues of Alzheimer's and cancer research, and profound in terms of global climate change, I mean, they're profoundly important areas that are going on in our very institution. And I think in our own small ways, in different ways, we, we make a contribution. So my, my area of history education, we're not going to feed the world or we're not going to solve global problems. But I think we can help develop uh, pedagogical practice and curriculum and work with teachers to think carefully about how do we make students more judicious, more critical, more empathetic, um, more understanding, more knowledgeable. And I think those are, those are the things that underpin our program is the sense in which we can help contribute to developing more thoughtful, critical citizens, and particularly young people in the, in the case of, of schools. And so I think that, that sort of speaks to what our broader goals are and how they fit within this, this broader structure. So we're making a small contribution um, in, a, in a university that's, that's huge and does so much fantastic work. Um, but I think that contribution is important. Thank you very much. I could ask this question, of course, to any one. Uh, of you, but I think it's Jeff's uh, turn next to make sure that everybody gets their fair opportunity uh, to uh, speak. Uh, Jeff, you are you know renowned uh, international expert in the field of multimodality and social semiotics. Uh, from that perspective, what how do you consider to be the sort of the you as an expert in the field? Uh, how, how can you go about making your uh, voice uh, heard, as it were, uh, to influence uh, thinking in, in, in your particular area, but well, as well in the world around us more widely? Well, so um, to, to give you one example, um, th there was a time where um, people were keen to become uh, excellent writers, and that was a, a, a way to become successful in society. Uh, these days, um, uh, many students aspire to become YouTubers and uh, they aspire to become very uh, skillful in, uh, in producing uh, media texts uh, that attract uh, attention. And so what we do in, in some of our classes is uh, looking very closely at the sorts of uh, uh, texts that uh, young people uh, uh, produce, such as uh, video games. Uh, so we take very seriously the, the work that goes into uh, uh, designing these kinds of texts um, and we jointly analyze those materials with uh, students, uh, which is another way of uh, collaborating, uh, so, so jointly interpreting uh, video as, uh, as resource data. Um, and so in that way, um, I, I suppose we are, um, are trying to make uh, relevant and, and, and make connections with the contemporary world where we are surrounded by digital technologies. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I alluded uh, in my introduction to the fact that UCL is well known for a particular approach to uh, the relationship between uh, research and teaching, namely the connected curriculum. Tejendra, may I ask you to maybe say a little bit about how in your particular program you're trying to uh, bring to life the, the ambitions uh, underpinning uh, the university's approach? Mm. You mean how we are trying to bring in research into... Yes, yeah, and, and bring the connected curriculum to life, uh, ensuring connections between students, students between students yeah. and the real world, 
and, and, and so forth. Yeah. So I think one of the things that we do in our program is um, promote um, learning partnerships uh, where our um, alumni who have graduated and gone out to work with uh, different international organizations are constantly in touch with us in feeding back into our um, teaching as well as research. Um, and, and also that is another way of um, uh, making our uh, pedagogy stronger so that uh, our students have the grasp of what happens you know, in practice in, in, in the organizations who would, you know, which would be employing them after they, after they graduate. But also I think we work with the international development uh, and humanitarian organizations uh, in collaboration to carry out uh, research into some of the most challenging issues um, that are faced by uh, communities in these um, circumstances. Um, and those sort of current issues uh, are brought into uh, the curriculum. So our curriculum is constantly sort of revised um, in order to um, sort of align with the most recent uh, dynamics and uh, issues um, you know, in, in the field. Uh, so I think that kind of partnership always uh, keeps on a sort of cutting edge kind of uh, level. And I get a sense that uh, our students um, don't want to listen to us about what already exists out there in the literature. I think there's this expectation, okay, we know what's been published and what's been written, we can read that, but what is new, that what is most uh, sort of cutting edge that you can, you can um, share with us in order for us to be at the forefront of the, the challenging uh, sort of global problems that we're going to tackle with. So I think that's what we try to offer, so which puts us in a really challenging circumstances, but also motivates us to carry out these um, sort of research studies. Th th thank you very much indeed. That sort of uh, allows us to move very nicely to a question uh, that I've just been uh, passed by, by my colleague uh, from the floor. And, and uh, Stuart, uh, can I direct it at you? You were head of department once upon a time uh, here at the IOE. Do Guilty. I, do I uh, recollect that correctly? Uh, and the question is, do all or most students, especially at graduate level, have contact with teachers and supervisors who are currently doing research? So can you just uh, think back, what did you do as a head of department to ensure that that was indeed uh, the case? Yeah, I think, I think as, as our colleagues have, have, have said, I think that's, that's central to um, the practice of the Institute of Education, that I can't think of anyone um, in, my, in the department, which I was fortunate to lead, that, that wasn't engaged in some measure in, in research and scholarship. And therefore, every, every student would have, would, have, would have been connected to someone who was active in research. And as colleagues have said, uh, that, that, that engagement was more than, more than just he or she's doing research. It's about sharing ideas and thinking about it and, and learning from each other. So I, I think that's absolutely central. I'm sure I mean, people are nodding around me. I think that's central to the way uh, the Institute of Education works and has worked for years. And, um, and uh, uh, if that's not known, then whoever asked the question, that is, that's a great question because it's central to the, to the, thank, to the whole way we work. Thank you very much indeed. Rupert, if I'm not sort of mistaken, you're a relative newcomer, or the yeah. relative newcomer on the panel, from an, uh, you've alluded to it earlier, from an esteemed uh, competitor institution. Uh, so uh, how would you assess the current UCL capacity to provide research-led education? Not necessarily inviting you to make direct comparisons, but uh, <laughs> given that you know other institutions relatively well. Well, I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of working at um, three institutions that, you know, that are doing cutting-edge research and, and putting in and bringing it to their teaching, and um, and you know, and, and UCL is very much one of those. Um, but I do find that the things like the correct connected curriculum initiative do show a level, um, a distinct level of commitment to that. But not just that, an actual framework. To, ma to manifest that commitment, because as you know, as I, it very much relates to my other work around values-led school improvement. You know, you, you can have lots of conversations about values, but unless you have a framework to relate them to your practice, they very easily become um, words on a wall. And um, we have um, structures in place through 
from you know through departmental meetings through, through the like to actually um, remind us of our collective commitment to linking students to research um, and to the and to the work of their um, um, to the work of their teachers um, to their own to and to the research in the wider world and to develop them as researchers so um, we are held accountable um, to ensure that we are um, trying to do that and and are um, can demonstrate that we're trying to do that in the way that we design and teach our courses. Thank you. And finally, and I open that up to anybody who wants to uh, answer it, uh, paraphrasing a comment uh, we've received from the floor uh, a, a little bit, uh, could we envisage a scenario where we wouldn't want to really focus uh, uh, in our teaching uh, very much on research? So what would uh, a non-research led, as it were, uh, approach to teaching uh, look like? Would it matter so long as it really uh, brings about uh, um, Edu educational outcomes, or, or, or could it uh, exist um, in, in that sort of context effectively? I don't think I can envisage what a non-research-led education would be. I mean, the mission of all of us is to improve the, well, at least one of our missions is to improve the educational outcomes of children and young people and adults. And it, in order to do that, we need to understand how classrooms work, we need to understand how people learn, um, and that requires research. I can't imagine that we could fulfill our mission without giving research-led education. Mm -hmm. And I suppose part of that is also to, to recognize that all research is partial and that mm -hmm. um, we, we can't produce definitive answers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that might be one risk that you would run if you left the research mm -hmm. out, if you just presented uh, knowledge as, as, as given and as, as, as final and definitive. I mean, I guess you could play devil's advocate and say that the next best thing might be, you know, if I had lots of time just to read all the research out there, which one never, you know, no, there's never enough time just to read. I think if universities, you know, if we had, let's say, if we had the, uh, if we spent perhaps, if we only had to write half as much as we do and read five times more <laughs> as a result, I wonder whether that might not be a good thing on occasion. But in, um, we could just read and then relate and use that as a basis for discussion with students, but what they would miss is the insight from the inside and um, of how research is done from personal experience and the passion of teacher researchers that goes with that, the, the ability to put their perspectives into practice to get the results and then share that with others. So it would be impoverished for that, that, that personal experience. So we're nearly out of time, but Stuart, it sounded as if you absolutely wanted to comment on this. Well, not if anybody else is, uh, is <laughs> desperate, desperate, des desperate to comment on it. Um, no, I mean, I, I just think that, as colleagues have said, you, you can't, I can't, can't imagine you work in an education institution with its missions to improve um, learning, teaching and learning, that you wouldn't engage with research, uh, it seems. I mean, if you just take a very simple idea from a history classroom, you're going to teach the Industrial Revolution. Well, you can get up and learn, get a book out, and you can say, here are the facts and so on. But there's no sense of how those young people are going to learn and what the pedagogical practice is and what underpins learning theory of those young people. And, and, and how do we know what's written about the Industrial Revolution is based on concrete research, and there are different interpretations from historical scholarship and so on and so forth. So just something that's seemingly quite basic and straightforward is actually quite complicated, and I think you know, we're not obviously going into massive detail. Um, I think we need to be aware, and, and that we're never at a final point. You know, we might, we, we might teach the Industrial Revolution differently another time because we've been informed by, by the praxis and, and by what we've discovered as a result of that process, and it will be different in different contexts, and so on and so forth. It's complicated, and only by trying to understand those, those challenges and issues through research, through research-informed practice, can we move, move forward and make a positive contribution. And thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for uh, spending some time uh, with us uh, this, this afternoon, and thank you, everybody, for coming uh, and uh, contributing. Uh, either by listening or by actively uh, asking uh, questions of us this evening. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks,